Okay, so um, that was kind of a way of looking at the history of things. Um, just to kind of see an anchoring alignment of what was going on the academic record. Um, we know what we manage now in terms of the academic record and that data is much larger than what it was back then. And now we'll play with data to kind of play with that a little bit more. So one of the ways that I find valuable to try to narrow in on the academic record is to look at it, data retention. Okay, so getting back to the data again, um, another way of trying to narrow in on the academic record is thinking about the ways in which we retain data. So registrars are typically very familiar with this and we manage ways, um, we usually have legal schedules by which we manage our information and define how we destroy that information. So I thought maybe I'd do is walk through kind of a, a timeline of a student and let's look at some pieces of information and how that kind of helps us look. So when a person first applies to an institution, you really don't have an academic record yet. You haven't engaged in anything with the institution except slapping a bunch of information to us to play with. So at that point, really, you exist for us. You're a person and you're a much of admissions data. We haven't accepted you yet. Um, you know, some institutions might start creating, you have your PI created, so you're documenting information about the person. You know, some might have a sliver of academic records started depending on how you handle they transfer credit. So some institutions start entering transfer credit even for their applicants. I mean, we don't do that, but some do. So, you know, it's getting a little recordy. But you don't have much of that. So then we move forward and we think, all right, now the student is actually here for the first semester. So now we've got more data on them. So we still have their person data. We've got their admissions data. That's really changed with that now. Um, we started to have an academic record. They're actually engaged in courses. We have that documented. They're sitting in classes halfway through the semester. We have a lot of transactional registration data for them. So we can see, you know, all, you know, if we think about things, say, 15 years ago, we have all their registration forms, you know, on file, which, you know, might have between one and a hundred forms, depending on how, you know, ADD they are with the registration. Um, in the modern day, you're going to have transactional logs out of your registration system that show every time they've come in, take a look at something, tried to do something, all the different things they've done. So you're starting to build that amount of data there as well. And advising data is starting to be collected. So now we have what we might call the advising file, the advisors call it. So you're collecting all their interests and things that they want to be managed for and the ways, the ways they want to go through their program and elements like that. So then we jump forward say a couple years in, they're halfway through, you know, we still got their person data, admissions data hasn't really changed, it's still sitting there. Um, academic records grown, we now have more data about them, so that's actually grown. Um, there's more transactional data because they've been performing more registration transactions, they've been playing with the system more, doing more kinds of things, and we're storing that information. And their advising file is probably also growing as they're running into issues, have advice they need, exceptions to policy, oh, don't kick me out. So things are growing and growing and growing. We're giving more data about them. So then we jump forward and look at the graduating students. So now the students at the end of their career their person data, still the same. The admissions data, we haven't touched it really. It's still still there. Um, academic records, now quite sizable. It's got their, you know, four years worth of work in there. Transactional data has continued to grow in terms of their registration records and what they've tried to register for and all those different kinds of transactions. That's grown. We've got quite a huge log on them. And we have, of course, their advising file, which has continued to grow, especially as they perform senior audits and different things like that that might go through the advising process. But then we kind of jump forward. So now we look forward to, all right, let's look at alumnus 20 years later. So, all right, 20 years from now, what information are you actually maintaining about a student? So we still have their person information because we know who they are and we need to identify them. But admissions data, gone. At least for the University of Maryland, our legal retention schedule, we destroy admissions data seven years after the student leaves. It's deleted, gone. Academic record? Well, yeah, we've got that. <laughs> we've got everything you've done, all the experience you participated, your grades, your degrees, we've got all that. But in terms of all your registration transactions, seven years after you left, every registration form you ever filed, destroyed. All your transactional logs, deleted. And your advising file, um, I mean, 
we don't actually manage that centrally, but the advising units destroy those seven years after the student leaves. It's gone, destroyed, history. We don't have it any longer. So what you have left really is this thing of the academic record and some PI data. And I think a thing to think about when we're looking at retention of data is um, for some people who aren't used to managing this information, it's not an issue of space. A lot of people just go, oh, it's just space. Um, you know, data's data, just buy another terabyte, it's fine. Um, actually, space isn't a primary issue. It's a slight issue for some of your old records, but it's really not the issue. Usually the issue is that of legality. It is, you are the steward of this data. The longer this trail goes back, the more responsibility you have to manage that data. So for a lot of institutions, um, being able to set standard retention schedules kind of helps with the stewardship of that data. The other way of looking at it, which I find useful, is looking at it from the operational perspective. A lot of the decision-making about how to determine how long you keep data deals with its primary operational use. So if we look at, say, the admissions data, what would be the primary operational use of an admissions record 20 years from now? I don't care what you put on your application any longer. There's nothing I need to do operationally that would require that data. I might have saved the fact that you were admitted and what the decision was. I might have that little slice, but all of your admission application data, all that stuff, we don't keep anymore. Your registration transactions, I don't care 20 years from now what you tried to register for on a particular day, on a particular year, doesn't matter anymore, it's not important. And advising, same kind of thing. So when we look at it from an operational perspective, these aren't important anymore. But in contrast, that academic record information is primary operational because we do know as institutions from now until perpetuity, we need to be able to respond to the request and we get some on a regular basis as to what learning experiences the student engaged in at your institution and what were their outcomes. So understanding these things about how records have evolved and how these other data have been managed, we can start to see how different institutions could be maintaining different information based on these factors. I mean, institutions evolve in different ways. We typically evolve with the uh, technical solutions that we deploy. Um, different things that we've done may have created different environments. We made different decisions about some of the outlying aspects of those boundaries between the academic records. Um, the other aspect that kind of makes this an evolving factor is as we've gotten computerized, there's more things we're trying to accomplish. We're not just looking at this paper record and crossing things off and typing things in and squeezing things in between the lines. We're actually trying to do GPAs. We're doing live GPAs so that when I make a change onto that academic record and change a course from three years ago to change the grade perhaps from an incomplete to an F. I have an expectation to have that GPA fixed through all of those cumulative calculations. Um, so we have a lot more data behind the scenes that kind of help manage a lot of that information. So what we might do is, you know, look at a course that you might see. So we have a student and they're in a course. There's actually a lot of things hiding behind that course when we think about it from a transcript perspective. So the academic record has to support a ton of data. So behind that, we know we've got, you know, what section of the course they were in. We need to know, oh, what was the title of the course? When was it taken? What was the grade they received that has to be stored? How many credits was this thing? We have different kinds of codes that track whether it was a repeat or not and determine how that's going to be interpreted by calculation systems. We've got special codes and notations, like that non-credit notation. I had to put a non-credit on there. That's data that has to be managed and maintained. You might have other special codes for other different permutations of courses that you need to record and display on your academic record system for understanding the, the experience of the student. Um, for some of us, you might actually have different types of GPA calculations, which you might need to flag a course for. For example, um, for some institutions, you have a graduate GPA, which is unique from your undergraduate GPA. And for some students that are kind of playing with, you know, dual degree programs and other kinds of, you know, combined programs. There are decisions about which GPA that actually, that course will be figured into. Um, those are things that we've got to track and record onto the, stu onto the course. And by kitchen sink, I just mean there's all, tons of other things, too, that I just didn't bother to put on there, but there's a lot of data behind that. So when we think of, oh, it's recording courses, great, that's that complex. 
there's actually a lot of data underneath that supports that course on a modern computerized academic record. And that's all data that we have to understand, support, build, and understand as being the academic record. So we can start to see a little bit about, um, you know, we've got this core element that we've seen now, you know, that we're pretty familiar with. I think all of us would say, yes, the courses you've engaged in are the academic record. I don't think anybody can argue that. Um, the programs that you're in are the academic record. Okay, we're good there. I mean, I always put my catch-all learning experiences because we know we also are trying to support ideas like projects and experiential learning and other kinds of things that we haven't yet quite put into place. But these are all things that we understand as being um, experiences at the institution that we need to be tracking. And of course, the outcomes of those things. So you have your grades, your degrees, certificates, blah, blah, blah. But as that's kind of come together, we've seen more, more information to kind of fill out the content of the academic record. So it's not just those things and what they are and what makes them up, it's ways of understanding it. So we start to see some aggregate data to understand the quality and quantity, which we're talking, of course, about GPAs, credit totals, and there's all kinds of GPAs, all kinds of credit totals that we support, and all of that is part of the academic record. We see different kinds of enrollment statuses that we might keep for a period of time, and each institution is going to have some various ones about that. Um, some of these being, you know, were you a registered student, uh, were you, you know, um, an undergraduate student or graduate student at the time in which you did things. There's different kind of statuses that we might keep about them. There's different types of eligibilities, which are kind of a, a, a version of holds that we would impact one's ability to be a student. And those typically are part of your academic record. For instance, if, if student B was not eligible to enroll at my institution during the fall semester because of a financial issue, I might record that as part of the academic record. It speaks to the academic record in many ways. Not so much the existence of the financial problem, but the impact on your education at the institution. You might have those also for, say, academic eligibilities, which, you know, dismissed. If you're dismissed, well, you know, I might have something to track that, you know, as of this semester, you, you can't be enrolled. And that's not just for relating information. That's also operationally important for a registrar to know we all know retroactive requests come in. If I see a request come in from a dean two years later to retroactive add two courses to a student's term, and I see they weren't eligible to be a student in that term, I know I can't do it, and we need to start having a conversation about what we're really trying to accomplish. So, I mean, these are not just about recording information, but it's also about operational needs and managing things like the academic record. Um, and we're also looking at relationships with, say, the program and the institution. So, you know, if you were, you know, if you were kicked out at the time, we kind of need to know that. If um, you weren't enrolled during a semester, so you didn't register any course, we need to have that track and understand that. If, say, in your program you were asked to leave in that term and they have a certain status they wanted to give you for that, uh, we need to kind of track those things as part of the academic record as well. So through this, we're starting to see all these bits of data that start to come together to build what the academic record is. And we've obviously we've talked about our native experiences, our programs and courses. Uh, we've had some conversations about transfer credit and how that goes with part of the academic record. We've talked about the terms and the cumulative calculations, so with GPAs and credits. Their program enrollment, this is part of the academic record. The credentials they've received, definitely part of the academic record. Um, different assessments like SAT progs and things like that, part of the academic record. We need to keep track of that. So having done that, um, another way we might play is talk about how we express our stewardship and how we monitor this data as another kind of quick way of looking at it. I don't know if this will work or not, but uh, we'll try it out. Let me know if, well, don't say anything if you can't hear it. Just wave at me. You can wave at me if this doesn't hear so well, and I'll just stop it. Or I could not. We lost. Doing videos across two different systems is a little bit challenging. The sound might not sync up right. A little. Dying into the school's computer.
They change the password every couple of weeks, but I know where they write it down. Those are great. Yep. I don't think that I deserved an F. Do you? You can't do that. Already done. Give him an initial. K. Catherine. This is my grade. How can anybody get a D in home ec? It's not none of your business. Can you erase this, no, please? No, too late. What are you doing? I'm changing your biology grade. No, I don't want you to do that. You're going to get me in trouble. No, nobody can find out. There, you just got to see. Now you don't have to go to summer school. Change it back. Okay, so I hope you would hear that. Um... That actually, in terms of registrar thinking, that's not too far off the point of the way we think sometimes. Um, I have to admit, I'm not as worried about somebody hacking in, because the securities are pretty controlled for that. And no, we don't have some one centralized password anymore, things like that. But in terms of catching different processes which lead to it, yes. I mean, I think that's something registrars think of constantly. We have very elaborate processes for how we were handling, say, paperwork back in the day. Most of our stuff's more electronic now, but to this day we get some paper aspects that come through for late grade changes from faculty. And yes, we get fraud constantly. Um, you know, we catch, I would say, back when I was more directly involved with it, I'd say we'd catch at least two a year where somebody had tried to forge a piece of paper, a document that was signed off and came down to our office to change a grade for students. So this is a reality in how we try to manage that. And typically as registrars, we have pretty tight controls over how things affect the academic record. So another way of thinking about it is from that registrarial perspective is looking at, well, I thought it'd be interesting to juxtapose, say, your registration system against the aspect of features that deal with the academic record. So when you look at the registration system, we've got tons of people touching that information. I mean, thousands and thousands of people. They're all touching that information. That's what the website is all about, right? So you've got students touching information. You've got parents touching it. For some institutions, we have parent access to certain things that students are able to give to them to touch information there. Um, we've got advisors who have access to the student's registration. Um, they can make all kinds of changes to that. We've got instructors who have access to a student's registration in terms of um, certain abilities to drop a student from a class that they're in. That's, that's touching the student's registration data. Um, and obviously administrators have access to this too. So we've got a whole bit there. And of course we have processes to help watch that. So we look at you know overrides and things like that. But there's a lot of people touching that. In contrast, um, when you look at, say, the access to those systems that manage these, these data and ideas and features, which are really about the academic record, it's typically a lot more controlled. You don't have large numbers of people with access to this information. I'll move on to the slide here. So, I mean, for that, I would give the example of, um, say, Maryland. Now, Maryland is one case, but I thought it might be interesting to demonstrate a point on it. Um, so looking at registration and moving over to academic record, um, so that part of our system that manages that set of data, um, one, we have very tight controls on. There's only a handful of people who have any type of authorization within the system to touch data that exists there. And that's done on purpose, and it's highly, highly audited. Um, an example of kind of our, the way we're handled by our legislature, we get a legislative audit every two years. Every two years, the legislature comes in and performs an audit of our academic record system. Not the registration system, specifically the academic record. And their point is to make sure that our processes are secure, tight, and we don't have issues like Matthew Broderick coming in and tweaking our things. Um, so they literally look at the number of individuals who have access to this set of data, and they will quickly knock people off of it if we have too many. They ask questions of why does that person have access to information. If we can't give a good enough reason as to why, um, they will require us to remove authorization for that particular person if they don't have a good reason to be there. And I think our number now might be, I don't know, we might have 
12 people within this institution have access to that particular set of data. I mean, I think it was even tough to keep my data to it, because I work more on this project now instead of an operational perspective. So even that was a lot of work to try to keep me access to them. Um, the other issue they look at is not only about access to it, but how you manage that information. So the way we audit the academic record information is we audit every transaction. Can you imagine doing that on the registration record? <laughs> I mean, that would be impossible to manage all of those thousands and thousands of transactions. But when it comes to the academic record, if somebody touched that system and made a change to a grade or made a change to the existence of a course, removed a course, that we have paper audit reports right now. Well, actually, they're system-wide now. But we have an audit report that shows the transaction, shows what happened, and everyone is examined. Um, the level of examination differs. There's typically what we call a review done in which you look at, you know, high risk changes. Those are usually, you see a C move to a B or a B move to an A. We kind of call those kind of a bit high risk, any of the upper ones. Down ones we don't usually care about too much. We don't spend a lot of time auditing those. But and it moves up, we typically do. Fs that move to high grades we typically take a look at. Um, and we do spot audits not only of that but of the staff. So on a usually weekly basis, we'll spot audit a staff member, pull all of the documentation they used to make that change, whether it was documentation from an academic unit, um, from an instructor, and validate that what they were doing was correct. And, and those are kept and stored for several years for audit purposes, and, but it's very regimented and it's very specific. So um, here it's just looking at like how we manage that data and the stewardship you kind of provide in doing that. Maryland might be an extreme example about the security and protection of those types of records, but you'd be surprised if you get. There's a third aspect of that that isn't really about stewardship. Well, it kind of is in the big picture. A lot of it's also about error and training. So there's that third aspect, which just means, you know, did the individual working with the data know what they were doing and do it correctly? That's the kind of a third aspect that we do for training. But not only people, we also recognize that there's a lot of systems that are touching it too. So. Some people are touching the academic record indirectly. So a good example of that is faculty and instructors. So instructors kind of touch the academic record, but they touch it through an indirect means. So they're going through the grade submission system, which is doing its validations, doing its processes, controlling those features, and then bringing that information into your academic record on scheduled periods. Registration, kind of the same way. So that all those transactions are happening, which are creating relationships with students and courses. And at a point in time or an aspect of um, transition that differs from the institution, you know, what you're in, you're in and becomes part of your academic record. And of course there's the learning management system as well, um, which we recognize, things like Blackboard, um, which is also storing information and at times will be going through a route to bring information to the academic record. <laughs>